task. This is witnessed in the interview who chose to do on a local news channel while in Lansing. By the way, per our attorney general, by statute, the governor's executive orders are law, so laws were broken. Now we are at increased risk because of the irresponsible actions of some that day, including Dan's actions for those of us in Saugatuck. I am scared, especially since my wife has an autoimmune disease and is on a strong immunosuppressant. She is in stage five renal failure. Therefore, we are strictly quarantining, but still need groceries and prescription drugs sent via the post office. If I catch COVID-19 virus, so does she. She has no chance. So do Dan's actions rise to the level of removal from his position on the Saugatuck Planning Commission and the Fire Board? I don't know, but it looks like an attorney has weighed in. Even if they do, I personally suggest it isn't worth the fallout, including the time and attention diverted from issues facing Saugatuck and its residents, such as flooding, loss of state revenue, and support for our businesses during this pandemic. Perhaps censure is an option to consider instead. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Anyone else wishing to comment? If nobody else is raising their hand. I don't know how to raise your hand. Uh, Kirk, again, I'm not seeing any uh, volunteers here. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'm not either. If, um, if anyone wants to make a comment, they can just unmute themselves. Or if you're on the phone, you can do star six and speak up and the mayor can recognize you. Hi, this is Vicki Cobb. Vicki, yes. Uh, I just want to say um, amen to everything that Glenna just said. I wholeheartedly agree. Thank you, Glenna, for a very articulate and balanced input to the team. That's all. Thank you, Vicki. Anyone else? Hello? All right, that, um, Hello? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Marcia Casper. Uh, I, I'm going to, uh, I'm talking about um, item 4A, um, the uh, strategies that were identified from Edgewater Resources yes. for the flooding issues. And just as a background, um, I have extensive <laughs> cost benefit analysis experience in um, my prior life. Um, and I just wanted to just say that um, that what there was a lot of you know work put into this, and I see that you know what they identified are um, the costs potentially for mitigating what I'll call you know these um, flood zones for lack of another term. But what is not provided is how to prioritize. Um, for example, you know, each flood zone and I've identified, you know, I'm just calling them, you know, A through H, or you could think of them as flood zones one through eight, as identified in the packet, um, that they're not equal. Um, so you, you, I would recommend not just looking at the cost, but also identifying what I, intangible factors. And these might include uh, public health and safety, impacts to public health and safety, um, impacts to the use of road and parking, because that, you know, continues to be ongoing issues in Saugatuck. Um, impacts to uh, residents, visitors, businesses. Um, I mean, there, I guess, you know, other, anything that is critical that you can't necessarily put a cost to, but you would be able to potentially, you know, do a high, medium, low ranking or some, or a, you know, one through 10 ranking. Um, red, green, yellow rankings um, to help the city council decision makers um, prioritize these. Um, and then the, uh, my other comment is that uh, these are what they've identified is one time costs and not necessarily ongoing costs or life cycle costs. So, um, you know, you, you potentially would may want to include okay, well, the, I mean, I don't know what these, you know, Hasco water pumps, like there's no annual ongoing cost to those. Do they break down? Um, things like that. Uh, and then like, if you put in a new building, they talked about a new bathroom, you know, what's the life of the building versus um, 
the life of this potential flooding and um, you know, continuing to, to do a temporary fix with these ESCO barriers. Um, so anyways, I guess that's my comment that, I mean, I'd be willing to meet with anybody to help out as necessary. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcia. Any other volunteers? I'm hearing none. Uh, Kirk, do you have any uh, indications? I do not. So if, uh, okay. if no one wants to unmute and be recognized or uh, press uh, star six to unmute star themselves on their phone, we should be set. Okay. Uh, do you have a comment? Uh, Dick, is that you? That was me. <laughs> do you wish to comment? I'm going to please. Yeah, go ahead. Just commenting on your review of the attorney letter that you're going to be reviewing at the end of your agenda today, uh, and I assume that this was prompted uh, by Dan Fox's uh, attendance at the rally in um, uh, Lansing. Um, just want to say, first of all, I know this is a stressful and emotional time in the issue for everybody, and that... I can't understand um, him at all. Yeah. Uh, Dick? We're having trouble understanding yes. you. Your uh, your audio is like breaking up. Yeah, and I am not sure why um, that's happening. <laughs> um, I guess what I can do is just refer you to my letter that I submitted to, to Council, the two, the one that went to the fire board and the one that went to you. And if you can hear me, uh, just asking that um, you just Take your time to review this, review uh, your oath of offices that everybody's been including Dan's, and solicit the fire chief's opinion of how he feels uh, this reflects on the department, and then move forward according to what your attorney urges you to do. I don't know if you're ready that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we caught most of that. Does anyone else wish to make a comment? All right, here in the, I want to make sure we give everybody an opportunity, but I, I don't hear any other volunteers. So let's move along uh, to our discussion items. Uh, the first is item 4A, Downtown Riverfront High Water uh, Report presentation by uh, Greg Wycamp and, and Daryl Veldman of Edgewater Resources. Uh, Greg, are you? On first, I am here. Here we go. Can you see me and hear me? Okay. Yes. So, um, yeah, we have uh, have a report here. It's uh, 17 pages and has quite a lot of detail. Um, I, I guess, in, in terms of, of a summary, I can ask you all to kind of go through this. I guess the question is, is how much detail you would like us to go through? Uh, we can go through each site uh, and option. Um, and of course, we end with a cost summary that, that identifies a lot of uh, the different items. And um, I think I'd start out by saying I agree with Marsha on the, um, the need to, the next step with this is, is to looking at a cost benefit analysis, um, but not just internally with these, you know, one site versus another or one option versus another, but it's really the cost benefit of these, this, these flooding elements versus all the other things you're doing in town, you know, the road program and all the other things you have to do. There's sort of a uh, I'm certain you have a lot of other things on your budget, um, and probably this was not one of the ones in the long-term strategic plan. Uh, so I think as we look at this, um, figuring out how best to put these together and make decisions is is the next step in the process, and, and one where um, you know establishing priorities is really the key. So I guess the first question is is how far into the detail would you like us to go? Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, Councilmember Lewis has her hand raised. Hi, let me, yeah. Yeah, hi, thank you so much. I think for, you know, given the fact that we have 53 people on the call, um, it might be good if Greg were to take folks through this and um, just provide some rationale sure. for everything. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jane, I thought you were volunteering. Okay, uh, Greg, um, why don't we go through each of the, um, uh each of the each of the items or locations and kind of with an overview i don't think we need to deep dive at this point sure 
Okay. Um, right. Well, we started out as this part, see her says, and you can go right to the first one. Um, we did an inspection. Uh, Daryl Beldman from my office, who was also on the phone. Daryl, are, are you out there? Can you hear us? Yep, I'm here. Very good. Um, so we did an inspection uh, with uh, city staff and looked at the options. And so um, there are a number of different sites. They all generally are along Water Street and down Butler Street in that area. Um, I think it's important to note that the flood considerations that we're addressing are, um, they're, they're driven primarily uh, by storm surge events. So we do not currently have uh, flooding at what we would call a static water level. So you see in these photos, the water is relatively flat. There's no waves. Uh, there's no large storm pushing in big waves from the west. And when that does happen, um, what's happening and why you get periodic flooding is, is sometimes it's from a heavy rain event with water coming down the river. But more often, I believe that it's coming from uh, what we call wind setup. And so if you have a sustained wind out of the west, of you know 20 or 30 knots and it goes on for many hours uh, it literally pushes the surface of lake michigan up it pushes the water to the east side of the lake a little bit like in the bathtub that sloshing and so for a temporary period of time the water is artificially raised as much as 24 inches and so that i believe is the primary cause of the flooding that you're seeing it's on a temporary basis it usually lasts um, you know from a period of eight to 40 hours depending now, sometimes it is also a combination of that with rain. So those two sometimes are together, but not always. So um, we looked at a series of strategies at each site. One is sort of continuing the current approach. Uh, of course, you've made a number of improvements at these sites or a number of, of uh, strategies for dealing with the flooding. Um, and we looked at that as, as, a, as a possibility at each site. So as you see each one, this one here is at the City Marina at the south end of Griffith Street. There's four docks in that location. Uh, when that water comes up from a surge or a high rain event, uh, those, those could have been submerged. And you can see in that first photo, figure one there, um, that supplemental docks were raised and set on top of the existing docks, and that keeps them mostly dry. So um, when, when we were out there, we didn't see any algae growth or anything that suggests that those are being uh, flooded uh, regularly. And so option A is to just continue and leave that be. Um, those could be raised even more as option two there, or strategy two. And then strategy three would be actually to uh, remove the entire dock structure and raise it to new elevation. Um, so the elevations that we typically think about when we build a fixed dock um, is, is uh, it's called low water datum LWD to LWD plus six. Uh, we are currently working with the city of South Haven to raise um, most of the docks in Northside Marina because their docks were built at elevation about 5.5 and so they regularly see flooding. So that would be another option would be to rebuild and raise those entire docks. Um, or you could replace them with floating docks. Um, floating docks is a good strategy because it always has the same relationship to the water. The complicating factor is that when the water goes back down, and I promise you one day it will, um, you find that the docks are quite low and then you now have to have to deal with a three or four foot vertical gap. So those are different strategies there. Um, you know, if, if I were to make a quick recommendation, I would look at this one as relatively low on the priority list. That's my personal opinion in terms of, we have a strategy that seems to be working for now. Um, and in the context of how many other people it impacts, I would say that's a relatively small number of folks. Um, but that would be my first reaction to that. Any questions on the first site? Chris. Excellent. Is that about the right amount of detail? Yeah, that's, uh, fine. that's fine. Chris, you, you're on. I do. On figure two, is that the electrical component? the white thing sticking up? Uh, yeah, that is a marina pedestal and that has, has water and power in it. Okay, so the docks have, all the docks have power there. I don't know the answer to that. I didn't look specifically and inspect the electrical system. I would point out that marina electrical systems um, are, are important to make sure that they are, uh, there's a thing called the electric datum plane and that where the connections, all the electric connections are, are above. They're, they need to be about two feet above high water. So in this case, they would need to be at elevation LWD plus 6.88. Um, and I don't know if that is or not. I didn't do an inspection for that specific feature. Thank you. Any other? Ken? Uh, Mark? Yeah, just point of clarification, Greg. Uh, I believe uh, figure one are Sergeant Marine uh, docks. They're not Saugatuck docks. Oh, okay. <laughs> figure two are Saugatuck docks. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
And the pedestal you see in two share is shared between the one side of the sardic dock and the, the west side of the sardic dock and the east side of the sergeant dock there. And I do, I'm pretty sure there's another pedestal between the other two docks also. I, I would point um, out that uh, there's a thing called electric shock drowning, which is becoming more and more uh, understood. Um, and and uh, it, it would be, I would recommend having that inspected by a licensed electrician uh, familiar with the marina requirements. Um, most systems built before 2010 don't comply with the current codes. That doesn't mean that they're not code compliant with the codes that were in effect when they were built. Um, but we have new standards that provide a safer electrical system for marinas uh, that we think are important to consider. Thank you. So, Any other questions on this one? Then let's go ahead to the next. Okay. So the next one is the south end of Butler Street. Um, so as you can see here, uh, Butler Street dead ends at the river. Familiar with that, of course. Uh, there's flooding in there. Uh, there is a catch basin that is under the water there in figure four. Um, you can see in figure five, the Butler restaurant has already has sandbags around the back. And you can see in figure six, uh, water ponding there. So just to be clear about what's happening with the stormwater system, when the, when the, when the lake level is high, um, that's bringing the water up at the same level. So the, the level of flooding you see on the roads throughout this entire conversation are generally going to be the same level of the water in the, in the lake or the river. And so when we pump it down, we have the ability to pump uh, the water off the street down into the river and protect it, but only if we're preventing more water from coming in. Uh, if that makes sense. So generally the, 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 the water you see on the road is the same level of the water in the lake or the river. We can move to the next page, please. Okay. So, so the current approach um, is essentially sandbags, closing off that part of the road. Um, and, and doing our best to you know, minimize impacts. It's also damaging the road. That's a long-term impact of this as a sort of a, uh, something to consider. Um, but basically the sandbags and, and doing minimum efforts there. Uh, option two would be to put in a barrier as I just mentioned. And so we would create a barrier significant enough to block all the water from entering and you have to follow the edge of the river in the lake until we've closed off all those the low points and then we can pump the water out um, you know and as good west michigan dutch that's a vast part of the country the netherlands is protected this way with with berms and dikes and pumps to bring the water up so this is we're not inventing anything new here um, it's a pretty straightforward process um, there are different types of barriers. It could be sandbags or a HESCO barrier. Daryl can talk about what a HESCO barrier is and those other elements. The trick is when do you turn on the pumps and is it a city crew doing it or is it a hired contractor? Um, and in some cases, um, is you could also do, well, plug and pump, I'll jump to the next option. Plug and pump looks at that uh, storm drain. So as I mentioned earlier, when the water's coming up from the storm drain, what's happening is is the water is actually backing up from the storm drain from the lake into the road. If you plug that off, um, that would be another way to deal with this. And that would need to be done in conjunction with some water barriers. So you can have a valve, you close it so you don't allow the water to flood in once we've closed it off with barriers. And then you could pump it out from there. So um, you could also uh, do that with basically a, a full, um, uh, <laughs> Daryl, what's the word I'm looking for? A lift station, basically. A pumping station. Um, so that would be more of a permanent solution and um, quite expensive, but they're done, those are done all the time. A sanitary lift station, you probably have dozens of them in the city. Um, and then the fourth option is raising the street. This is really more of a permanent strategy is, is and, and this is what communities who are dealing with sea level rise rather than what we're dealing with, which is a, a cyclical situation or a situation with, with storm surges. If, if you're in Miami, for example, or a lot, of, a lot of parts of Florida, they're raising the roads to create permanent barriers um, to prevent sea level rise from flooding inland areas. Um, it's incredibly expensive and difficult. In Miami, it's about a million dollars a mile. Um, here, it's less money because it's not as complicated a situation with utilities and so on. But making the point of raising the street, that is a permanent strategy that if, 
if for some reason we had a, a, set, a sense that Lake Michigan was going to permanently go. So currently the water level of Lake Michigan is LWD plus four. Um, last summer it went to LWD plus 4.5 at its high. We expect to see 4.5 next month in May. We expect to see about 4.75 in July with the current projections. Uh, it could go over five. If, if somebody were to tell me um, that we would see Lake Michigan at plus seven or eight for long periods of time, then you'd be looking at protecting downtown. Then I would say, yeah, we need to think about raising all of Water Street and creating a permanent barrier to protect downtown. Um, so in this context, yeah, it's certainly a viable strategy, but it's, it's, a, it's very intrusive and would have a lot of follow-on effects. Any questions about this option? Bruce. The site. I do, and this is maybe for Vicki if it's still on. When the, when the new sandbags came out, is it still flooding in the basement of the butler? Do we know? Okay, that would just be a question I have with what we've done, uh, if that has stopped the flooding. I, I, think, I think Steve Phelps was on here. A bit. It was. I'm here. This is Scott, this is Scott talking. Hi Scott, was there, is it, did it continue to flood in the basement? Uh, we haven't had any since uh, November storm. Okay, thank you so much. We did. This is Stephen, and we did stop it one time with the sandbags uh, after the November storm. Thank you. The sandbags that we put out. Right. Okay. Any other questions? And we appreciate that. Mark. Yeah, uh, Greg. Uh, I didn't see this in the report regarding this location, or if you're aware, there is no seawall at the foot of Butler Street, mm -hmm. nor through Sergeant Marina. Mm -hmm. So when the Butler Street end ends, the seawall ends at the Butler property, it doesn't get picked up again to Griffith Street. Okay. So is that a viable long-term solution? Because yeah. the, it, I don't believe many seawalls have been breached yet well so the question is 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 yeah you could build a seawall there and, and then we would set a proper elevation um so we would set a proper elevation of maybe 6.5 um to try to minimize the amount of water that could come in but you could set that at plus seven or some other elevation so yeah you could build a new seawall that would essentially perform that same function and then you would need to look at the areas uh, adjacent to that wall where maybe the water can currently get around it. So it's really all a question about the elevation of the top of the wall, but certainly that's a really straightforward um, way to handle it. You would need to address all the, the boardwalks and everything else that it might impact, but it could be done. And the other thing I'd like to bring up then is if we did do that seawall, you'd have to seriously consider what you want to do with that uh, stormwater, that catch basin because that lake level as it goes up, it's just gonna boil back up through that uh, catch basin into yeah. the end of Butler Street. So then you'd have to consider doing a valve there to plug that off during high water events. Why is that different than these other proposals? Well, it's a combination of things. So the valve really only makes sense when you've stopped the water from flooding in over the surface, over the wall, right? So if we manage to put in a wall or a barrier that pre prevents the lake from flooding in by just coming over over the top of the wall or through a parking lot, then the only way for the water to get into that area would be to bubble up through that storm drain. And to prevent that, you would want the valve that you could close it at those periods to prevent that water from bubbling up. So it's a combination. Okay. Any other questions on this one? And go ahead, Greg. Excellent. All right. Moving on to the west end of Mason Street. So we're a little bit around the corner now. Um, again, Mason Street also dead ends at the river. Um, you can see from the debris in there that there's been some flooding uh, or significant enough storm events in other areas to convey all that debris into the area. Um, at, the, at this point, if we can zoom up a little bit uh, under the strategies, uh, we can continue the current approach, uh, which is basically um, to keep an eye on things. It's not um, is, is impacted to some of the other sites there. Um, but the, the water should stay within the curb line. Uh, it can be breached though. You could apply a water barrier in this area um, to keep it from uh, entering the Coral Gables property and into the street system, uh, or you could raise this end of the street as well. It's a, a relatively small area, 
Um, so pretty straightforward options there. Not a lot of different things to do other than just put in a barrier and or raise the street. Okay, do you have a recommendation on any of these? We'd be happy to hear. Yeah, my thought on raising the street is, is um, that's, that's a, a pretty extreme action. Uh, and and th to follow that through with the engineering, I could show you images from, from Miami um, where, uh, so for example, there's a, a little grocery store that had an outdoor dining courtyard, for example, out on its sidewalk out in front. Um, when the road comes in, now that little outdoor dining courtyard is sunken, okay, because the road is now 30 inches higher or, or maybe three feet higher. And so now the old storm drain system, just like we talked about at the end of Butler Street, that storm drain system is now the source of the water. So they have to either close that off or pump it out. And so maybe in this location, it wouldn't be such of an issue because we're kind of at the downstream end. But if you get up to the corner of Lucy and Water, as we, if we were to raise those streets, we might actually create flooding for the businesses on the east and north, well, I guess the, the city, the downtown side of it, I should say. Um, so what is that east side, I guess. Um, so that's the one, ch the biggest challenge with raising the street is there's, it's going to be a, a cascade of little small things to solve um, that are going to mostly require pumps and valves and things to prevent that flooding from occurring. And in a case like this, um, again, if we were building a new seawall along this edge, I would raise the seawall, um, which is the same thing as a barrier. In this case, the HESCO barriers is a simple one. Okay. Okay, moving on to the next so Wicks Park Marina, um, there's five docks at this location, uh, partially submerged. Um, the current approach, of course, is uh, we're not necessarily doing anything special. Um, there's no algae growth, which suggests that it's, they may get wet from time to time, but they're not constantly underwater for extended periods. We may see some of that this summer for the month of July when we're at our peak, um, but the, the, sur the deck surface uh, remains reasonably dry most of the time. It might be submerged during a peak storm event, but not long enough to create a real slip hazard uh, when, it's, when the waters are lower. Um, so your options here um, would be, uh, I continue as you are, just you don't change anything. Um, you could raise, uh, well, it's what we call a piggyback dock. You put another dock on top of the, the pier structure you have there. So that would be item two, um, and that could be a temporary situation, and that is done it's being done in marinas all over the Great Lakes right now. Uh, it's a relatively simple strategy. Um, those could be removed and you could consider floating docks. Uh, I honestly believe putting floating docks in there is probably more complicated um, than you would like to do. It's the, the access to a floating dock that's going to drop very quickly in such a short dock would require an adjustable stair, um, which is not a problem. It's just a, it's, it's a relatively more expensive strategy there. Um, you can raise it up just a little more. The other option would be to raise the docks and the boardwalk and some of the sidewalk. Again, basically, you know, build a new seawall, a new edge, and bring everything up to plus six or plus seven, you know, six or seven, somewhere in that range, um, and basically use that as creating a barrier there. So that would be basically a reconstruction for that piece. Any questions on that one? Yeah, go on. Okay. Moving on to Wicks Park restroom facility. Um, so you have the, the small, cute little building there with the, with the murals. Um, obviously, it's kind of tucked into a low point. You can see in figure 11 there and figure 10, uh, when that water comes in, uh, clearly we're flooding the building. Um, you know, there's, there's really only two strategies there is to pump it out or, or to raise the building. You can also see some of the catch basin there in this picture. Um, the current approach is, uh, um, you know, you, you know, water level is just about the catch basin frame there. Um, if, if it's not ponding, we have to, you know, keep the water out from the building there. You could put the barrier in and pump it out um, as, as option there under two there. Uh, put a HESCO barrier around the catch basin, put barricades around the basin or, or in, in the whole pumping scenario that we talked about. Um, when you get down to the building, uh, you could raise the building. Probably the cost to raise a building that small would be about the same as building a new building or, or, the, or so much that it would probably make more sense to build a new structure. Um, I would elevate it in that case. Um, I don't know how often that building gets used and how, you know, how critical that piece of infrastructure is. Um, you know, I visited uh, Sagatech with my family many, many times, and I know my kids have always used that facility, so I'm sure it's well used. Um, 
Uh, obviously during a storm event, people, fewer people are out, um, but if we have the ability to, to either block the water from getting in or to pump it down quickly, and then we'd have to create an access over the sandbag. So that's a little bit awkward. So uh, my preference would be, barring the cost, would be to raise that building or replace it um, so that you're not chasing that problem all the time. You can slide down on the paper a little bit more there, please. So those are those are kind of the options there. Daryl, do you have anything else to talk about with that catch basin? No, that's really it. And that's the, the biggest challenge is that the restaurant facility is in a low spot. And it's... Um, I'd like to ask Scott Herbert uh, um, what kind of uh, effort is required to keep that thing in operation? Well, when it, uh, when it's flooded out, obviously there's some health and safety issues there. So we, we just simply close it down when the water gets to the point where people can't get into the building without getting their feet wet. Is that a major uh, cleanup operation for you? For your EPG? Not major, it's all um, concrete block construction in there with the exception of a wooden box uh, on, towards the floor for uh, the water feeding into the building. So it's, it's, it's not a major issue. Okay, any other questions? Greg, on to the next. Very good. I'm sorry, Mayor. I'm sorry, Ken. Yes. Sorry. This is Garnett. Um, Scott, do you, in your opinion, do you think that HESCO barrier would help then to keep that water out of that restroom in a manner that was safe? I, I think a HESCO would be a bit overkill for that spot. Um, if I recall, the HESCOs are about four feet tall. Um, you know, it after talking with Jeff Yoakum from the USACE, it might be possible to do um, contain the flooding, uh, almost build it like a sandbag structure around that catch basin, um, line the bottom with plastic, and then it might be able to have have a, almost a miniature pool inside of a sandbag structure around that catch basin, just like what you've seen uh, the folks um, at Water and Lucy Street, similar to what they've done in their effort at Water and Lucy Street. All right, great. Thank you. Chris, did you have a question? He cut out and I didn't hear the last thing he said, but that's okay. Okay. Greg, on to the next. Yeah, so while while we have that picture up, actually, you can see on, I'm pointing at it like you can see me <laughs> pointing at it. It's funny. Figure 13, uh, water level just below the frame there you can see how close the water is to the surface and that's the lake level or the river level that you're seeing there. Um, there's been a number of conversations about, well, can we just plug that and just close that off? Uh, and the answer is sure, uh, we can do that. Um, but you have to keep in mind with your stormwater system, you're gonna just displace that water movement to some other part of the system. And so if we were to plug a number of these storm drains in various locations, we might start to introduce flooding in new parts of town that aren't currently flooding. Um, so I'll, I'll defer that to the heavy civil engineering team, but those are, those might be great surprises just because you're just, you know, the water has to go somewhere. It's going to seek its own level. So we might prevent it that way, but it might introduce a new problem somewhere else. So if we can slide down to the next one. Well, hold on just a second. Question what? there that, I'm sorry, but yes. just because of your comments there, are we sure that that catch basin serves more storm sewer than just that particular area? This I mean, do we know, yeah, do we know if any, Scott, do we know of if uh, any of the water street drains go into that or anything else? That I mean, that's the only, catch, go ahead, I'm sorry. That particular catch basin is simply uh, from that catch basin straight to the river. So why you can't you plug it? Because yeah. it, it, there's no other, nothing else that feeds it. Would that not that, that go a long way toward solving the problem? That may be a possibility for this one. Yes, I understand I, that. Yeah, I was talking about as a as a I got it. I understand that. That's why I asked the question because I don't even think this one shows up on the stormwater survey that was done. Mm -hmm. So that might be one more option that we should add to this is and it might be worth a try. Just to see what happens. That's probably something that should be researched right away because that's going to be a relatively modest expense overall. Uh, if it's not going to cause any, re, you know, residual damage problems somewhere else. Scott, have you got any concerns no. about that here? 
the only thing I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, ballooning off a catch basin system, but my only question would be, um, does the balloon, is it, is it, is it watertight or does it allow some sort of small um, seepage through there that would still have to be pumped out? Daryl, you have any thoughts on that? My understanding is they're watertight. When I, when I've seen them in use, um, contractors using them in the bottom of a trench for whatever, sanitary sewer, storm sewer installation. Um, I've always seen those to be um, pretty watertight. And what's nice about ballooning is you can relatively easily, you know, remove and replace those. I mean, it's, I say that it's, it's usually underwater and the guys have to go down there and try to jam that balloon in there and then they fill it up with air. But uh, my understanding is they're watertight, but then we got to make sure that we've got pumps there because now our pumps are, the only way that that storm water is going to be removed from that uh, that area, that vicinity. Yeah. That would stop the water coming in from the river, but if it's raining, of course, now the rainwater is going to pool and pond because it doesn't have an outlet. So, Correct. Uh, so, okay, let's carry on, if we could, please. Yes. All right, down to uh, uh, Francis Street Road end. Um, Daryl, why don't you walk us through this one, please? Uh, at Francis Street, the, uh, I call it the boardwalk, but it's the concrete there right behind the, uh, the sheet pile wall has uh, started to settle. And some areas it's maybe a couple inches or some it might be three or four. And um, exactly. So what that's indicating is that the fill material that's behind that wall is starting to seep out between the joints and the sheet piling. And uh, there's probably a void underneath there right now. And we would recommend that, uh, you know, that concrete be pulled back, uh, filter fabric be installed on the back side of that sheet pile wall, and then uh, new uh, material be placed back there, graded, compacted, and then a, uh, the concrete slab would need to be uh, re, uh, replaced, report in that same location. Um, then also to stop the uh, water surge from coming through this gap and pouring into uh, Water Street, like you can see on pictures, uh, figure 16 and 17. Uh, again, recommend placing a, a HESCO style barrier um, from that sheet pile wall. You can see on the, in figure 14, it's about maybe 15 inches uh, gap between the one wall and the other wall. So we would need to at least have that barrier as high as that wall on the south side and then in figure 15, you can see there's a sheet pile wall by the air conditioner unit by that white building um, that we would have to have that barrier go all the way up to that point. No so, questions? Yep. Okay. On to Spear Street. So um, Spear Street, I'll take this one, Daryl. So uh, the boat launch, uh, here um, is, is a very obvious place where the water can come in. You can see on the picture of figure 18 there uh, that the fixed dock is submerged uh, during a surge event. Um, and that water, if you can see in figure 20, has the ability to come right up the ramp, right around the curb, and that shoots to the north uh, and goes right down to the Lucy and Water Street intersection. And that's a significant uh, source of, of incoming water. Uh, fortunately, that's a relatively straightforward fix. You can put a barrier across that. You could simply close the boat launch for the season would be an option. Um, there are other launches in the area. Um, I recognize that's an impact for folks. I don't know how often people use the launch. I know there's not trailer parking right there. Um, so I don't know that that would be you know, as popular as, as Schultz Park, for example, or, or the launch over by Red Dock. Um, Greg, if I get this is Kirk, if I could jump in real quick. Um, I've been contacted. I just wanted to let the council know I've been contacted by the um, um, business owner that owns the Harbor Duck, and he uses that facility um, for his operation. He just wanted everyone to be aware of that that he uses okay. the boat launch. Well, that that's good to know. So there's a there's a, a regular daily use, I imagine, assuming he can get back to business soon. Um, so. A strategy would be, um, you know, an inflatable water barrier that you could, you know, you could plug that off uh, when an event is coming, um, and then you could remove it when that event is not there. Um, 
I don't know if he's operating in, in flood conditions like this. Um, I guess that would be a question. Um, but you can also see in figure 20 there, if you look at the, the kind of the bubbles in the street there, that is water bubbling up also through the storm drain backing up from the river. Um, so there's two sources there. One would be the water coming right up the, the ramp basically. And then the other is the water bubbling up from that storm uh, in that lower left image there. So um, the, the other strategy of course is to, is to sandbag. And right now there are some sandbags that are in place, uh, not in this image, um, but there's some sandbags like you can see in figure 21 that can prevent some of that water from moving around the corner in lower events. Um, you know, it could be flanked uh, in significantly higher events. Um, but the option right now, the current approach is uh, the sandbags um, and, and, and doing what we can do there. Um, option two is a water barrier. That's one that could come in and be taken out uh, as needed. Uh, that's the water filled diversion tube. Um, you can close the, the ramp in those locations. Uh, you would also want to raise, uh, temporarily raise the dock section for the boarding dock. You can remove and raise the dock um, is a permanent solution as well. Um, and I think there's one more down there below five. Uh, no. no. Right. Okay. So basically the only strategy is there. Again, you could also raise the whole thing. The challenge with raising, this, this is one of those sites where raising uh, Water Street, for example, might create an unintended consequence. There are specific slopes, maximum slopes, for allowable uh, safe boat launch access. And that, that max slope is about 14 to 16%. If we were to raise Water Street, we might find that raising it a foot or you know, whatever we would raise it to might make it to the point where that, that ramp is no longer viable. Um, we, I'm not saying that I've done the engineering to solve that, but I would just point that out that that's the kind of, uh, kind of potentially unintended consequence that we'd have to think through in the engineering process. So basically the strategy here is, is real simple. It's either sandbags or, or a temporary structure um, to, to prevent that water from coming in because right now it's just so low that the water can, can breach quite easily. Any questions on the boat launch? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lewis has her hand up. Sarah? Hi, uh, Greg, thank you so much. I have a question about this and this kind of, uh, I'm curious, is a pump not an option at this location, kind of like the pump that you're suggesting further on with the Lucy Water Street end? We, we Just could, curious. We could do that as well, but I think part of the challenge is that um, with the size of the opening, it, that pump could easily be overwhelmed. So I think the strategy here is we need to, you know, if it was just that catch basin, then we, the pump can keep up. If it's the whole width of the boat launch, it might get overwhelmed. So okay, and it's thank you. Come down to Lucy, where we talk about if we jump to Lucy here at Water Street Lucy intersection, um, and so you can see here in these images, uh, obviously uh, really significant flooding on that corner. The road is closed, uh, hard to access businesses, um, and the, the water coming in here uh, can come from the boat launch. It can come from the gap between uh, the small cottages. Uh, it can come by the driveway. Um, uh, near the boathouse and the stormwater system backing up. So what's a little tough to see, if you look in figure 24 there, kind of in the upper right, you'll see uh, some sandbags and a little cone. That's where the catch basins are now. Yeah, exactly, thank you. That's where uh, the, the openings are now and there's sandbags there, yep. Sandbags there with pumps and, and that is intended to keep the water out. Uh, obviously this is a pretty significant event. It's gonna take quite a bit of time to pump that much water out. Um, so if we slide down to the options below there, um, so even if we were to address, so the homes uh, already sandbagged uh, at the cottages, um, uh, but you can see, yeah, there we go. Thank you. And uh, if you could actually go up to the previous page, so you can see the sandbags are in place there. And then you can see uh, in figures 26 and 27, you can see the sandbags and the catch basins. And you can see in 28, uh, you can see the hose that's going over from the, the street side, which is on the right, over to the river side on the left there. And so there's a pump in there. Um, so that's, that's the current approach. If we roll down to the options, please. Um, so the current approach is, is sandbags and pumps and just trying to manage and maintain that. Um, 
that's, that is a quite common approach. We see it a lot um, for temporary solutions. So it's a little frustrating because it's, it's not particularly fast. Um, so uh, the, the big obvious move there would be to upgrade the pump system. Um, that would be a HESCO barrier uh, to make a better barrier than the sandbags, less maintenance there, a bigger, stronger, faster pump. Uh, that pump would need to be operated by city crew or a contractor. Uh, you know, the cost for doing that is, is 11,000 for a contractor um, or city personnel, maybe 13,000 for a contractor. Uh, Daryl can jump in and talk a little bit more about how those were uh, established. Um, option three is this, this plug and pump again, as we've talked about, um, if, if we can contain the water from coming in at the boat launch and the other access points, uh, if we put a valve, um, in the storm drain, we can stop the water from bubbling up. We'll still need a pump to pump the water out that's gonna come in from the rain. Uh, so that's a combination system there. Um, and then on, uh, also putting in a permanent pumping lift station, uh, which would really be the permanent solution. Um, and that's something we're seeing uh, in areas that are uh, considered really uh, critical to the general infrastructure and that's you know, how do you determine which is more critical? That gets back to the first question that Marsha raised in the comment section is, is it's hard to judge which of these is the most important in context with all the other things you have to do, but that's about a $320,000 effort to do that pump station. Uh, then you could also raise the street, uh, as we've talked about, you'd be addressing driveways and a bunch of other things. Uh, that's probably $450,000, so a pretty significant effort there. Um, question? Sure. Um, Greg, I wanted to ask, if you look at figure 26. I'm sorry? Did you, did you think at are you, uh, did you think at all of kind of building, I don't know if it's the right term, a seawall around that uh, at the curb side uh, to keep the water out from the uh, yard in front of the uh, Mill Pond Realty Office? Which figure are you looking at, 26? 26. Can you go back to that, please? I'm sorry, Greg, what, where did you want me to go to? Figure 26, I think the next page, uh, page 14. There you so go. So where would you, where would you? Well, um, it wouldn't have helped in this particular situation, which looks like the worst it's ever been. But in most situations, uh, at least for the last few weeks, there's been water up there and it has been um, um, going up over the curb and into their front yard. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking, is it, feasible at all to build some kind of seawall along that curbing. Maybe seawall is the wrong term, but raising right. that area to at least keep the water out uh, from the yard. I know it's not going to solve the whole problem on that street, but you, it you, might could, help a little. you could build a raised curb. Um, that would be an option. We were looking at focusing on getting the water off the street, so we didn't look at that in particular, but a raised curb in that area uh, could be considered. It would need to extend far enough up the road uh, to make sure that it's not flanking through a driveway entry or a, or a wheelchair ramp or something. Sure. Um, but yeah, that would be uh, certainly doable. Um, aesthetically, when, yeah, I guess I would think you'd want to like turn it into a garden bed or something, because it might look a little odd from the backside, from the business side. But yeah, that would be a strategy to at least keep the water off that property. Um, Daryl, what are we getting for curb and gutter these days? About 20 to 25 a linear foot? Yeah, correct. Right around there. So this being taller is probably going to be, call it 30 or $35 a foot. I'm just pulling a number out of the air. We could run an estimate, but, you know, if it's 100 feet, that's, you know, $35,000, something like that. So that's a, that's a potential strategy we could look at. To it. it wouldn't address the water in the road, but it would address keeping the water off that property. Yeah. Okay, just ask. Yeah. Uh, all right. Any other questions? Uh, Chris. Going back to, to Ken's question, so then would the, in front of that seawall or whatever, would we still have the sandbags and the pump? Well, yeah, what, the, what that raised curb would do is it would just keep the water off the private property and off the right of way. It would just contain the water more on the road. It would also probably, because whatever water is flooding out into that property, it would, it would it could slightly increase flooding on the road, for example. Uh, that's how long the water stays there is really a factor of how big a pump we can put in. 
um, <laughs> and how quickly the, the water level goes down. You so you would still have, have a pump of some kind. Yeah. You still have to have the pump and sandbags there like they are yep. now. They just move yes. them. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, Greg, you want to go on to the, uh, where are we, the NOAA predictions? Yeah, the NOAA projections, as I've mentioned, um, so the reason we've had such high water over the last five years, well, we set a record low in 2013, as we mentioned um, a few weeks ago, or I guess a month and a half ago when we uh, had the first council meeting. Um, uh, that was the record low from that time period. We had the winters of 13 and 14, which had really incredible ice cover. And then we've had the five wettest uh, seasons in the last five years. So we've set a one year, three year and five year records for precipitation in the last five years. Um, and we're not getting the evaporation that we typically get in the winter time. Evaporation is uh, the vast majority, over 90% of the, of the water that leaves our basin. So it's the, the water that leaves through the Chicago River and downstream into Lake Erie and other places is a tiny, tiny fraction. It's like one or 2% of all the water that leaves the basin. It's all about evaporation and less incoming precipitation. So uh, the projection right now is that we're gonna stay at this high end of the re uh, historic range over the last 102 years. The historic range is from minus 1.13 to about plus 4.88. So it's about a six foot range. We're quite close to that high end of the range. Um, we're gonna set some monthly mean record highs this summer. Uh, we we it doesn't look like we're gonna hit the all time high, which is 4.88, but we'll be within a few inches of that. Um, the projection is that we'll stay in that range. We might go an inch higher a little bit, but nobody's projecting right now, not Noah or the core, significantly higher highs that would make us rethink all of the things that we've done. Uh, if you look back over the last 102 years, uh, we've been here several times before. Um, and the thing is to keep in mind is whatever decisions we make right now, uh, we have to live with those fixed infrastructure pieces when the water's back down at minus one. So a fixed dock that's might now be suddenly seven feet above the water, which can be a, a maybe it's not an equally bad problem, but now you're talking about dredging and other concerns. So we have to keep those things in mind. So we've been here before. We, if you remember the mid and late eighties, uh, we went through the same situation. So, so the cost from here just really takes all of those elements and puts them on one page. And uh, as was noted earlier, we, didn't, we, we weren't asked to kind of set priorities. Um, really, that's a conversation internal to the whole big picture of the city. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm not going to guess uh, there. Clearly, from, in my opinion, I would be looking at, as we talked about, you know, impacts to businesses and property damage. You can look at things like the West End of Mason Street. Probably not that huge a deal. Same with the marinas. Um, it's gonna affect a few people, but maybe not as many as Lucy and Water or the end of Butler Street, for example. So I think that's, that's really how I would think about it. But in context, um, your current strategy uh, is functional and is a, is a common and, and normal approach. Uh, in, you know, most communities have limited funds to deal with these things. So I'm not certain how, uh, how these things fit in priorities with everything else you have to deal with right now. Council? Discussion? Mayor? Uh, Holly is first. Uh, I, I have a question. It's for Kirk and Pete. I'm wondering um, what, um, I want to talk about the docks. How much money does the city make on uh, from the docks? And I'm just wondering what people on the council feel about keeping those docks. Peter, are you on the, um, can you hear the conversation? Here's muted. Muted. You have to unmute yourself, Pete. Let's see here. Oh, hold on a second here. Let me get the, um, I got the numbers here on my computer. You're talking just about the docks at um, Hoffman Park that we partner oh. with, uh, with, um, oh. How many docks are we talking? Are we talking eight docks total? Is it three and five? Is it four and five? That we're no, I think at? it's only, I think what we do, there's four docks at the end of um, Griffith Street and mm -hmm. two of them are licensed 
um, straight out as a part of a street end agreement and the other two are managed by the marina and we they give us part of the money that they receive so you're not talking about a, a large number of uh of uh docks at that at that area yeah i want i want to say the pay they pay us once a year it's like a 60 40 percent um deal with sergeant marine and you know, we average any, I think the past year was the least amount of money they paid us was four grand and the highest it's ever been is about $6,500 for, for a year while they manage them through the, the season. Okay, thanks Pete. Um, uh, I'm not sure which order, but Chris had a question and Garnet has her hand up as well. Uh, Garnet, should we start with you? Yeah, uh, Greg, again, thank you so much for this. It's it's wonderful, actually. I really appreciate the time you've put into this. Um, you know, just my observations for my colleagues on council. Um, we obviously are aware of the main issues, the pinch points, if you will, being, in my opinion, number one, the Spear Street boat launch, and number two, the Water Street and Lucy Street intersection, and then probably the the Wicks Park restroom facilities. And um, you know, given what I know as far as the workload for our DPW. Uh, I think we would be wise to utilize our contractors uh, and, and take their help um, where we can, uh, at least in those uh, three areas that I've mentioned, and then otherwise use the water barrier recommendations and the upgrade of the pump system. Um, and I, I think for the time being, uh, given what we know with the NOAA data and the Army Corps of Engineers data, uh, you know, we're looking at you know, all told with what Greg has provided us here, if I were to kind of, you know, we're looking at $38,000, $39,000 to $45,000 of expense out of our budget to cover this and provide some relief to our businesses that are down there on that corridor. That's it. Okay. Uh, did we lose Chris? Y you did. I'm back now. I lost okay. I lost all of the response to Holly's question about the uh, docks, and I missed what led what Garnet led into hers about. So, what? How many docks do we have, and what was the discussion? Um, there's, there's four docks down there, the sergeants, and it's a 60-40 percent arrangement that we have with Sergeant Marine. For the season of 2019, we were, we were paid. I yeah, the actual numbers here, $2,100, in the season. Oh, and we had two of those docks, I think, were completely underwater. And in 2018 season, they, we made $5,800 off those docks. So last year's season, the 19th season, is the least amount that we've ever received since I've been taking control of the numbers. And the reason that it was so low is that um, because of the high water down there, a lot of the time the water was pretty close to being over the top of the dock. Um, so they weren't able to rent the docks as much as they were in the in past seasons, so the high water was a reflective of that uh, and I'm, cost. I'm not so much interested in the income off it. I just like us to have the ability to control the street end, uh, depending on whatever happens with boardwalks, et cetera. Right. Dan, you can have a comment. Mark? Yeah, I, I think we're confusing boat slips with docks down there. Uh, I believe there's four boat slips, two docks that are on city property. Uh, and the agreement with Sergeant Marines is that they're supposed to be used solely for transient boating. We have a very small amount of transient boating in our community. And uh, that was the kind of the impetus of working out that agreement with Sergeants Marina. Uh, we have no, we have no uh, expenses related to that operation. Uh, so those are, this is, those are my comments. Uh, so I think they're pretty critical because they're the only, you know, the few places where, uh, well, not that, that, you know, it helps the transient boat, uh, inventory in, in the community. And those people that usually dock there are the larger boats. So hopefully they're going in town and spending some bucks and everything else. So they're, they're not rented year round, they're transient. I, I agree with you, Mark. I think they're critical because we are really under under slipped, if you will, for transient voters, and uh, that's a good source of income for the economy. Um, 
Any other comments, questions here? Uh, it seems like we need to go through a prioritization process, and I'm not sure whether to do it as part of talking about our, our total priorities for the city, which, which I think makes some sense, or uh, spending more time maybe at a later workshop going back through here again and trying to prioritize uh, what we do with each of these areas. I, I think Greg was um, sort of recommending that our current strategies are, um, are pretty acceptable, except for the uh, Lucy, Lucy Water Street situation. Um, I don't know if we agree with that. We could, we could go forward on that basis. Uh, what's your feeling? Carmen. She's muted. Garn, you're muted. Got it. Sorry. Good now? Yep. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm curious um, how Scott with DPW feels, um, where they are as far as their capacity and what they feel they can handle, um, certainly on several of these recommendations that call maybe for city personnel involvement. Scott? That's what I was trying to get at before, Scott. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to attend a workshop if you want to, you know, have a conversation about which ones to prioritize. Um, you know, Wicks Park restroom, if it's as simple as ballooning off that catch basin, that one seems obvious to me. Um, I'm not sure if that would require special equipment to install or uninstall that balloon, but it seems like a fairly inexpensive uh, option to keep that restroom open which gets used heavily. Um, mm -hmm. you know, music in the park especially Wednesday night, that thing is is nonstop. So to me, that one's important. And I think it's fairly doable. Um, but, uh, you know, talking on site with Daryl and, and Jeff, the other most critical one is Water and Lucy Street. And really, it's, it's going to take a collaborative effort to, you know, if the goal is to simply keep water off the street, um, you know, we have to address each of those weak points, um, you know, and, and slow that rate of water when it does surge onto the street. And then it's all going to depend on the capacity of the pumps uh, in terms of DPW staffing, how we're able to manage that water. I'm not sure. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not really something that I'm experienced with right now. <laughs> so um, it's really just going to depend on the, the amount of water that we're talking about and how frequent that is. All right. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Chris. Hi. So the, if I'm hearing right, Ken, the question from you is, do we, we separate our other priorities with parks and rec from this group or do we merge them together to find out long range what we're supposed to do? Chris, if I may, I think what we really need to do is probably um, put everything together um, and prioritize because you're only going to have so much money for everything. I so agree. I think we, we just put everything on there and work these projects into the rest of the capital improvement projects. I agree. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, we need to know what the, you know, what the size of the, of the bank is. And then I think we we're all kind of agreeing here that within this particular um, uh, issue topic, the flooding, uh, we sort of are in agreement with the priorities, but we still need to know how much we could spend to fix them. Uh, Garnet, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a quick question, and and I really appreciate that the fire department has been available for us here at our East Shore Harbor. Would it, and, and I apologize, I think I know the answer, but would it be possible in times of extreme high water levels to have the fire department blast out like they did for us here um, with the water cannon? I mean, just to get that water off the street fast. As you know, they were terribly effective here. I mean, they pumped <laughs> half a million gallons of water out of Turtle Pond. So, yeah, I mean, that's something we have to look at. Good suggestion. Um, Barry. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, lower my hand. Uh, it's a holistic deal. I mean, we got to look at this as part of our uh, whole budget and this is a critical uh, time right now it's a critical issue and maybe we got to do some juggling but we've been working on our capital improvement plan for 
uh, well, forever. Uh, yeah, Holly and uh, Garnett have been involved in it for since uh, November, and uh, we talk about it all the time. But it's a, it's a, it's the big picture. Uh, we can't take all of our city money and fix one thing. Uh, we got to look at everything that we've got on the line. So uh, that uh, was one point. So I agree, looking at it all. And the other thing is uh, the fire department. There's a cost associated with them uh, helping the city to do that. And uh, if we're going to use that option and they're available, we should get an idea from them what it costs them to do it because that's our problem, not theirs. Okay. Other comments? Uh, Jane. Yeah, uh, the fire department I'm sure is only too willing to help out where they can. Um, I know they've ha helped Scott in the past with the corner of uh, uh, Lucy and Water Street, and um, we're always, they're always willing to help. It's just how much they can help. And um, a lot of it we call training. So, um, but there is a cost, you're right. So I think um, your project can, they pay, the association paid for the fuel. We did a lot of training on our aerial truck there. So, um, and we also needed to know where your pond was and where it wasn't because if there was a problem there, we didn't want anybody to park in the pond. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're, we'll be as collaborative as we can be, I'm sure. Um, so, okay. yeah, I, I, I think we should look at the whole um, finance of the city and see where this works in and how much we can possibly do. Okay. Uh, Kirk, what's our schedule now for uh, uh, setting priorities and, uh, and the budget? Well, what we we'll want to do is um, now that we kind of got this, uh, the Zoom meetings working out pretty good, um, as you know, the governor's order that we have right now will expire uh, on the 30th. Um, that may be extended, we don't know. Um, we're also hoping that the state of Michigan allows municipalities to use this format moving forward because there's still there are some concerns with us trying to meet in the very small spaces at City Hall. So um, the next workshop that we have, you know, Peter and I have been working on this throughout this period that we've been closed to the public at City Hall, but uh, we need to get things on the table and start talking about them. And then obviously Peter is going to talk a little bit today about some of the existing finances, but my advice would be we, we would put everything on the table and start having discussions. Okay. Um, and well, yes, Mark. Mark here. Here. Yeah. 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 Uh, I kind of, and if I kind of following up on Garnett's comments, uh, and, uh, the priority issues and an approximation, she did a, just a quick summary and added it up. I'm thinking this needs to be fast tracked. I, I don't see why we need to put this and incorporate it into a long-term strategy or anything else. It's not going to do any good in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. And I, I don't see why we just, I don't know what our meetings, how heavy a schedule we have Monday nights meeting, Kirk, uh, but maybe we can, the council can, you know, review this stuff and we can put it on the agenda and maybe we can have some type of a priority that we can turn back to, to Edgewater and give them a budget to work out, you know, these items of $50,000 budget and get to it and see what can be done here in the next 30 days. Yeah. All right. Garn? Yes, this is Garn. I totally support that, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, we have no time to waste. It's April. The high water's coming. I mean, they got snow in Marquette, like, you know, I don't know, two feet, and it all comes this way. <laughs> so for us to wait, I, I really don't think we have the time. I would, I would suggest that we move fast. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may yes. speak. So the, um, the council's already appropriated some money in the budget, about $20,000. Um, that was done through a um, action of the council here a few months ago. Um, I so. So the purpose of this the purpose of this report was to get some strategies, and then as long as the council identifies which of those strategies you want the staff to execute, and um, so if you tell us what you want to do, we can implement those as fast as possible. If we need to amend the budget and add more, we can. So 
it's really just taking these this report, having council identify what you want us to work on, and we'll do it. Monday, we don't really have, to say the truth right now, we don't have any action items on the agenda. So we definitely could um, make this a topic, have a discussion, and um, this council could give the staff some direction and we can get moving on it. Chris? Yes, um, I agree with that. The part about when I said they had to be worked together, right now I'm not in support of any of the 200, 300, 400 thousand dollar options. I think the ones, I think the ones that are small, we could move on those right away. But if we are looking at the three and four hundred thousand dollar ones, those have to be part of the larger discussions. For myself, the, the current way we're handling it and some of the suggestions with the barriers and the pumps, I think that's the way to go and we could do that quickly. Okay, so feeling is we could put this on the agenda for Monday night and uh, uh, Kirk? Yes. Yeah, I, what I would recommend is, you know, you, this obviously this is the first time you've been able to see this report. So we'll put it on as a as an agenda item. Um, but over the weekend, take a look at the, I think if everybody looks at looks at the strategies and we come to the table on Monday with some ideas, um, maybe hopefully when everyone gets there at the table, we'll have a consensus. Um, but be prepared to come to the meeting with your recommendations and lay them on the table and see if we can get consensus and move forward. Good, okay, are we all in agreement? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can we ask and see if Greg will be available for Monday's night meeting? What time is it? I assume it's in the evening. I'll be there if it is like four or after, sure. Seven. Seven o'clock, yeah. Yeah, no problem at all. Good. Appreciate that. Great. Okay, well, and I want to thank uh, Edgewater for a, a good job. This, I'm really impressed. You, you did exactly what we needed you to do, and I uh, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to help. All right, moving to the next item, the Saugatuck mm -hmm. Financial Update. Peter. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to bring up the first sheet that we have in front of us is the actual fund balances or cash balances as of June 30th of 2019, so about 10 months ago. The um, general fund, the unrestricted, was at 1.9 million. The general fund committed to the parks was a million. Major Street Fund, 453000 The local street, $1.3 million. For a total of you know, $4.7 million of, of cash on hand. And so the unrestricted one at the top, the city's policy has been many times is never to let that drop below a million. So there's about $900,000 of excess unrestricted general fund monies. So that's where we, and that's, those are still accurate numbers. Then I just want to remember also with the engineers, the capital improvement plans in the past, currently they have eight and a half million dollars of road projects and park projects that are on the city's plan. And then get down to where we're at for this current fiscal year as of today. You want to bring that down a little bit, Kurt. This is just a summary of all the revenues of the general fund in the center column where it says 2019-20 amended budget. Um, there you go. The original budget was $2.7 million. Through today, we've collected just shy of 2.7 million. So we've collected about 97 cents on every dollar that we budgeted. And then some of them with the boxes around there at the top with available balance were still collections. The first box had circled with four sets of numbers. We're gonna get collect that money that's going to be paid to us from the Allen County Delinquent Tax Fund in June. The other single box, that $34,000 figure, that is the state sales tax revenue. We originally budgeted $83,000. We've been paid $48,000. The state of Michigan still owes us about $35,000. We're not going to get all of that. It's going to probably reduce to by about $8,000, which, you know, some people have heard worse numbers from the state, but I've always budgeted only our constitutional sharing amount because there's two different parts to sales tax. So we're still gonna collect probably about $27,000 out of that 34,000. The other two with the, the numbers, the $11,000 figure, the $19,000 figure are Oval Beach revenues. You know, you can see to the left of what we budgeted, what we collected and what still do. Um, I don't know if those are gonna be collectible. One is the state of Michigan will allow us to open up Oval Beach. Um, especially the health department's gonna 
if they're good, the health department has control over the concession stand because we have to have a license. And I guess it's a wait and to see what the um, happens from the directives out of Lansing. And the other figure that, not the, the below the box on the bottom, the figure that says 17,000, those are street ends where we've got signed agreements from local business people that they're still not due until June 30th, hopefully that they're collectible. Um, so those, though, that's our revenues right now um, for this current budget year, which ends here less than 60, roughly about 70 days from today where our new fiscal year starts on July 1. So if we can go down to the expense side on the general side. Here's a consolidation of all the general fund, our expenses. The general fund together was budgeted 2.7 million through today. We spent 1.4 million. There's still 1.3 million that hasn't been spent. The first box, it's circled with the arrow to the left. It was $65,000. We originally budgeted about $50,000 to have City Hall, you know, have new siding, something done with the paint and have maybe the siding redone and, and some upgraded, more efficient window systems here at City Hall. And then farther down, the large number of $691,000, there was $550,000 was in this current budget for the improvements at Mount Ballhead, that park area, which I believe that's on hold right now. Um, all the other available balances, I think most of those are probably, a lot of that's gonna be spent, you know, basically on wages and, and the police, the sheriff's cost, um, getting the parks up and going. Um, there's still gonna be a lot of costs at Oval Beach you know, the staff has removed the erosion control fence. I believe we have a the contractor coming out to put the sand back, push it back towards the lake. So there's still a lot of upscaling cost to Oval Beach. And hopefully the beach will be ready to go for Memorial Day and the sun will be out. So that's the general fund that where we're at currently right now on the general fund. You want to go to the next other two slides are basically on the major streets and the local streets. On um, the major streets at $76,000 available balance, we're gonna get that money. That's basically property taxes that people paid this winter that, that are filtered through Allegan County. We'll get that money probably in early to mid June. Act 51, that's basically your sales tax, or not sales tax, it's the gas tax. Um, it does not, just because gas is a buck and a half a gallon, it, the gas tax is based on, on units, not on, on dollar amount. So. The problem is that gas sales are down nationwide by about a third of because of the local pandemic. So we're still probably not going to collect, you know, I figured on the gas tax, the first one, it's probably going to be off by about $5,000 um, for this current year on the major streets and probably another $5,000 on the local streets. Um, there's probably not a lot of expenses currently going on in the street department. And the major streets, we do have one more truckload of road salt that we'll have to take, and that's about the only outstanding bill. I mean, there'll, there'll be some um, routine maintenance with the street department with cost. So that's the major streets. Um, if we go down to the next slide, Kurt. This is the local streets. The same thing, that $77,000 the arrow. We're gonna collect that money that's coming from Allegan County. We'll get paid in June. Um, the Act 51, which is the gas tax, that 12,000 realistically will probably collect probably about seven to eight thousand dollars for that money. So we're in good shape there. We go down to the routine maintenance at three hundred sixteen thousand dollars just left. That was was in the budget for the upgrades of redoing Park Street north of going north past Mountain Ball Edge at the city limits. Um, I'm not too sure. I'm sure that project is going to go forward, but it'll be probably in fiscal year 21. So overall, we're, I think we're in great shape with this current fiscal year. Next fiscal year could be some challenges. Um, the majority of our money, our, our, the general fund comes from property tax revenues, which the figures, the values are set for the 2021 budget year. Um, the only big things I can see falling for the 21 budget year is if the economy is not going, the sales tax revenues, I, I would predict it could be half or less than half. So the state of, in the past, you know, last year we collected $90,000. The state of Michigan paid us, you know, for our revenue sharing. So half of that would be about a $45,000 loss for fiscal 21. If 
if the pandemic is still going, lingering on. And the same thing with the gas tax. If people aren't out driving and if everybody's not back to work, the units are going to go down. So the gas tax, um, a year ago, we were paid $181,000. And they say that gas revenues are off or gas gallons are off by a third. So you're talking maybe up to about a sixty thousand dollars of lost revenue for 21. Um, I don't know if anybody has any particular line items or other questions because I've got my laptop here with all the figures and facts. Any questions? I have a question. Uh, Gar I'm sorry, Garnet first. And I'm just... uh, that's okay, Chris. Go on ahead. Uh, yeah, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, Peter, explain to me what could possibly happen with the property taxes based upon if the pandemic would continue on. Well, tax day is December 31st, so it's basically the property values have, we have to have sales of falling property values. So it basically as it works, if our assessor says your place is worth a million, that's what's on the current roll and you, it sells for only half that, then it's going to, sooner or later, it pushes everybody down. But that takes, that's going to be 18 months to 36 months down before you start where it starts pushing those numbers down because they go through sales studies. And the sales study for 21 it was is basically it's already closed. It, it, it ended April 1st. Mm -hmm. So all the numbers for the 21 numbers are already, that window is already closed. So you're, you're talking, at least that's why I say it's going to be at least 18 months out before you're going to see prop, the property tax the values on paper actually fall. It, yeah. It's a lagging system and that's basically ran through the, by state law. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Garn? Hi, Peter, Garn here. Hey, um, I know you listened in on the um, update and resources for lo local governments webinar that um, the state treasury and uh, MML provided a couple days ago. I'm curious as to your thoughts specific to the extension of the income tax date and also uh, anything related to our taxes. So I recognize that we won't see anything really impacting us until uh, next fiscal year, but I'm curious as what your directive will be from the state treasurer regarding collection of taxes and assessment of late fees and that kind of thing. Well, currently their, their assessment is everything is on, it's all by statute. So the legislatures have to change anything to do with, you know, the due dates, the penalties and the interest. Um, there is a deferment process, but you know, it has to be your primary residence and it, you have to, your income has to be less than $40,000 a year. And basically that defers the interest and penalties from the summer bill to the winter bill. Uh, the income taxes, the city that we don't have, I. That, I think that was referring to only cities that levy a city income tax. Okay. So that's, okay. you know, that's where we're at there. But yeah, with all the late fees, the interest is a state by state statute. We could look at maybe, and I think it's an ordinance. I believe it's an ordinance in the city charter with the penalty of that 3%. So I don't know that's something Kurt or the council could take a look, but I believe that's an ordinance that somewhere in the city and the taxation thing or with the penalty that if you don't pay by September 14th, we have people, you know, we don't take postmarks. So that's something maybe Kurt could review with, with Jeff to see, because that's by ordinance. So it's something that would have to look at currently. We can't wait until September 13th to look at it. Yeah, it's, a, it's currently city ordinance. All right. And a follow-up to that, Peter, um, and forgive me for my lack of awareness, um, revenue sharing and PPT payments how would we be impacted from what the notes I took from that meeting that revenue sharing payments will go out the end of this month and yep. uh, county revenue sharing also at the end of this month and PPT payments in May, any impact to us? Well, the, the revenue sharing, yes, basically we'll get a check here the 30th of it. We get a check every 60 days from the state for the revenue, which is basically sales tax collection. And that, that check will be fine because that was the collections from January and February. It's the next every 60 days from now, which really this pandemic really didn't get, I don't think affected us until we get to the March. So it won't be to the June. And, you know, usually like the June payment in the past is around 12 to 14,000. You know, if it, even if it's half that, it's only going to be about 7,000. And I've always budgeted low on the sales to X revenue. 
um, because it's all, there's two parts of sales tax or the revenue sharing. There's the constitutional and there's the statutory. The constitution, the legislators cannot, it's in the constitution. They can't change it. They can't take it away and divert it somewhere else. But there's another factor that's statutory, which they could take that away tomorrow. So that has to be action from the legislators. The PPT is personal property tax. And that's basically, we get very little of that because it's all based on a wall they changed here five, six years ago. And that's all the industrial exemptions and they made changes. So there's a payment, it's very little to, little to us. And I mean, it's like, I think it's like $2,000 because we didn't really lose a lot of personal property tax. We don't have a large industrial base here. The county revenue sharing, that's basically the state giving money to from the sales tax program and that goes directly to the county. So that does not affect us at all. All right. And then my last question, I'm sorry. Uh, the other item that was mentioned by Rod Taylor, um, municipalities can file for an extension of the audit. Um, do you think that's gonna be necessary for us at this point? No. Okay. No. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you, Peter. Yeah, just a comment. Yes. Ken, Mark here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Peter can, I think he touched on it, and hopefully we all are cognizant of it, is that the Rio revenue potential issue is going to be Oval Beach with either, uh, if the beaches get closed down, that's self-explanatory. But then you've got the issue with the uh, social... Uh, separation, uh, the beach is a little bit less size. I, walk, I walked it just uh, the day that they took the fence down. Uh, so that's obviously if you have to have your 10 foot distancing, that's gonna play an impact of how many people we've got. That's gonna be a real challenge to, uh, from a budgeting and a management standpoint. And I'm sure Kirk and, and Pete are, uh, and, and Scott are kind of concerned about that. Yeah, Mark, we are. We, we the, With the high water, we probably lost about 40% of the beach from previous years. So that does um, put people in a little bit closer proximity to each other. Um, and then it's kind of unknown right now what the um, if the state's going to come back with any type of requirements that we have to close anything. Um, so that's up in the air. So we're, we're evaluating all of that. Hopefully with... Uh... Uh, some potential funding that'll come down from the state, from the federal government or the state government might not even be contemplated yet, but this might be an area where we would have a legitimate, uh, hopefully a legitimate uh, opportunity to get some type of, of, you know, reimbursement or, or assistance because it's not too much different in our budgeting from losing tax revenue. It's, it's plays such a big part of our uh, overall revenues for our management of our parks and recreation. Right. All right. Thank you, Peter. Yep. Let's uh, move on to the next item, which is the Department of Public Works update. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have a very brief update for everybody. Um, you know, we have we have two goals moving forward, and that's number one, keep employees safe so we can keep keep working uh, at a distance from one another. Of course. Um, you know, last week we were able to. Or I'm sorry, this week. Uh, we were able to remove the erosion control fencing out at the beach fairly quickly. Uh, we also got the beach, um, the sand replenished on the main part of the beach. So, um, and I've got the dozer scheduled to come in on Monday. So we're still operating as if we're going to be opening up. And, um, you know, obviously we'll, time will tell what that looks like. But um, moving into the next couple of weeks, we're, we're just trying to keep town looking its absolute best. Um, I've got mulch coming on Monday. Uh, we can do that uh, as individuals. We don't need to work near one another for that. Um, we're also using this time with fairly vacant streets to uh, get a jump start on a, lot of, on a lot of our street painting. So painting crosswalks, parking spaces, curbs, center lines. Uh, we'll be starting to do that type of work next week as well. Um, you know, in addition to that, we're going to try to keep, uh, we're going to work towards getting the uh, Wicks Park restroom, Oval Beach restroom, and Mount Baldhead restroom functional. So if we can get that key turned and the door open, we'll be ready to do that. Um, 
you know, and moving forward in the next couple of weeks too, after the, the beach is dozed, we'll start raking the beach and get the large amount of debris that's off of it. So that, that's, that's really what our schedule looks like for the next couple of weeks. Okay, uh, questions for Scott? I see none, so thank you very much, Scott. Thank you. Um, next is the uh, economic relief review that uh, Kirk put together. I think it's a good piece of work. Kirk, you wanna present it? Yeah, at the last council meeting, there was some conversation about exploring some possible ideas for economic relief for the local businesses. One of the primary concerns, obviously, for the businesses downtown is uh, making rent, as well as a lot of other issues that they're faced with right now. So I did quite a bit of research on this to try to determine what options are available to the city of Saugata. Um, some other cities around the nation and also in the state have been able to offer some of these um, sort of stimulus payments, so to speak. And what we found out is they're able to do that because of some tools they have in their toolbox, such as having a an economic development corporation or, or also through a downtown development authority. Um, Saugatuck does not have those tools in their toolbox as a lot of cities in Michigan don't. Um, so that's a, a major impediment for us to be able to, if the council was interested in taking funds, uh, the general fund and dis dispersing those back to local businesses, we need some type of vehicle that's legal that would allow us to do that. Um, I've reached out to uh, um, a lot of different people and, and we're coming up with the, with the same result. So in terms of the answer of being able to do that right now, um, we're not finding anything that allows us to, to travel down that road. Uh, Chris. Uh, I've listened to the, the cast that Elizabeth Estes has put on with a variety of people. And I, I think, you know, sometimes just by good luck, we have somebody like Elizabeth with a marketing background and everything she has to do this. So I was very impressed with the stuff that has been handled already in terms of marketing and, and uh, other ideas for people to get together with technology and, and uh, sanitation issues. Uh, one thing that I had thought about was, and it was mentioned, I believe, yes, yesterday or today, is a community foundation. Uh, if, we want, if we're looking for specific ways for specific money to come into a specific community, a community foundation would be one of those. So, uh, so you know, I know that the Douglas has the Downtown Development Authority. As you said, we don't have an avenue, but this might be one uh, way to start money to flow to specific businesses through a community foundation. I'm just throwing that out there. <clears throat> now, the other thing too I want to bring up is, you know, the, uh, the the fact of the matter that the city doesn't have a legal mechanism in place right now that could disperse actual cash payments out. Um, there are a lot of things that the city can do and we are doing, because um, obviously with the report that Scott just gave, we want to be turnkey. So when the executive order is lifted, um, we're ready to roll. And um, Scott's crew and his staff has been putting a lot of uh, effort into the parks so that when that does happen, we'll be ready to, to be up and, and people, if they do, people come to town, the businesses will be happy with the way the town looks. We've also implemented some um, hand washing stations, which we, did, we didn't have in the past. So that's gonna be uh, um, something that we, we hope to offer as well. And so th there are a lot of things that, that the city can do as a whole. Another um, thing that's being talked about with the local group is um, opening up the downtown streets periodically through the summer too. Um, and obviously that would just be something as simple approving or something as simple as the city council approving, you know, special events throughout the summer. So, so I guess I just want to kind of put that out there that the, you know, if we don't have that tool in place to offer some type of financial assistance, there are a lot of things that we can do, keep the city maintained um, at or above expectations. And so we're ahead of the curve and have some, something to offer that maybe other communities don't around Michigan. Yeah, Gary. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> a couple of things you brought up that I can address a little bit. Um, I was on the council. I think I kind of floated the idea of a downtown development authority or a principal shopping district or the different vehicles that we could have 
uh, taken you know, some of the tax money, set it aside uh, incrementally, and uh, use that to invest back in our business community. Uh, the merchants and the building uh, owners ran away screaming, so they were not interested in that at all. Now, retrospect, maybe if we would have done it back then, we'd have a little money, but we don't. So that's uh, kind of the history of the DD, DDA and Saugatuck. Uh, as far as the community foundation, uh, little do people know that years ago, and I was actually the president of it, the Allegan County Foundation uh, did a sub-community foundation for Saugatuck. And uh, that was through the efforts, and I believe Peg Sanford and people that are on the Allegan County Board of the foundation at the time uh, floated this idea that maybe each community can have a subset and uh, we would go out and solicit money and uh, the neighbors contributed to that and I believe they got a uh, tax deduction on it. It was, a, it was a good deduction. And we did build up some money uh, many years ago. Uh, Jim Selman was on that uh, board with me and uh, he's still around you may remember, uh, Martha Hexter and Douglas was on the board. And, you know, in, in the end, as, as it kind of petered out, we couldn't get anybody to volunteer to be on the board as, as things happened, you know. And uh, so it kind of faded away, but that money's still there somewhere. And I don't know if the Allegan County Foundation just absorbed it into their uh, greater fund and then said, oh, well, we got this much money, let's dole this out to Saugatuck. Uh, that would be worth finding out. Maybe we've got a little money sitting at the Allegan County Foundation. Yes. Kirk, do you know anything about that? I don't, but I can look into it. That's way before your time, Kirk. Yeah. Okay. Garner? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Barry, I'm just curious what we're talking um, here time. How many years are we talking back ago that this was going on? Maybe 20 years ago. Okay. I just saw something, I'm doing a lot of cleaning in the house right now, as you might imagine, and going through piles, and I found something with uh, Community Foundation reference to it, and, uh, you know, it's, if it's before Kirk, it's easily 15 years ago, you know, maybe more. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes. Uh, kind yeah. of going on with uh, uh, Barry, and Barry, you probably know more about this than I do but I still believe you could resurrect a sub fund through the community found Allegan County Community Foundation for Saugatuck, utilizing the entire investment portfolio and power of the entire foundation revenue base. Uh, I believe that's where you were going with, uh, with the advantage of joining the community foundation. They've got it already set up. Right, that's and they're right. like side funds, but we participate in the same investment. So you've got the power of the big numbers working for you on the investment side. That's so exactly I think, Kirk, that's right. something maybe you can also look at yeah. with them, either resurrecting that because that's a. I think that's a pretty that that's got some promise. Well, your mom um, used to write checks to us, Mark. So <laughs> she used to write checks for, to me too <laughs> a while back, but. Uh, Yep. Uh, maybe Kirk could look into that with the, uh, I don't know, Teresa is still heading the Allegan County, uh, but she was there when this was going on as well. And she'll remember, she'll know the details about when we faded out with volunteers to run our Sovertech subset and uh, what happened to the money. And, you know, they should have records back there, how much we, you know, put together before I'm it faded. Do something. Hmm? But to Mark's point, they definitely, our money went in with theirs and we had the advantage of the bigger bundle to make our share of it. Yep, I'll look into it. Okay. All right, let's move to the, uh, the next If item. I met, I'm sorry, sorry, Ken. Sorry. Mr. Mayor, this is Garnet, I'm sorry. Um, this is a question for um, Kirk, please. Um, again, referring back to the question I had for Peter regarding the uh, COVID updates and resources uh, webinar that was provided by MML and the Treasury. Um, they specifically mentioned FEMA Public Assistance Grant Program. And that was basically that local governments or eligible applicants 
and that emergency protective measures um, that would basically protect public health and safety, they were encouraging our local governments to apply for these funds. And um, there were three things that I noted. Um, uh, basically, those funds could be applied to disinfection of eligible public facilities communications with the communities regarding uh, sharing information about COVID and basically how to keep yourself protected from the virus. And then the last was actually registering, registering well, to apply for these federal grants through the portal. Do you want to talk about that, Kirk? Yeah, the, um, I'm on uh, weekly meetings with the Elgin County um, Emergency Department and Scott Corbin, who a lot of you are familiar with, um, he's going to be my main contact for that. So I'm reaching out to him and um, they're really actually organizing all that stuff through, through emergency management. Um, so that's going to be my first step is to get some direction from Scott um, at that office and see what is available um, and what we would maybe, what opportunities we may have. So I'll be having some, probably some more information at Monday night's meeting on that. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Chris. Uh, yes, this is for Garnet. Uh, since she's a newbie, I don't think you realize that if you bring it up, you write the grant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's in my background. I can do that. Uh -huh. I can do that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, on to the next. Uh, uh, City Attorney Memorandum of uh, 422 2020. Uh, the question uh, came up and, and has bo been boiling up on, on social media about um, the removal of somebody from a commission. And so we took the liberty of uh, consulting with our attorney to see, to try to determine just exactly what authority the council has uh, to remove anybody. So this is not, this discussion should not be related to any particular person. This question has come up before where members of the public have called for uh, council members um, designations uh, because of political stands that they took. So um, uh, our council provided us with this memo, which uh, kind of indicates that uh, I'd point to item number three that says, although a city has some latitude in determining what constitutes removal for cause, there must be a direct connection between the misconduct and the performance of official duties. Um, so Kirk, would you want to elaborate on any of this? Well, Ken, I think you, Mr. Mayor, I think you pretty much hit the, the nail on the head here. Um, the council did receive some communications from citizens. So um, to be proactive, um, I sent um, the city attorney some communications and said, can you look into, this to, look into this for us so that the council has accurate information? And um, this is the response. So the, 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 um, what we're hearing from the city attorney is that if the council proceeds with any type of removal, you obviously have to go through the hearing process and things of that nature. So there is a process that you have to follow. Thanks. Any uh, discussion or questions? Uh, Holly, were you raising your hand? Yes, yes. Okay. So um, I was a, a little confused or a little um, disappointed to see this included as an agenda item today because um, right now we have people in this town who've lost their incomes. We have businesses who don't know if they're going to open. Um, we have businesses worried about flooding. Um, we're all very concerned about the budget. And um, I don't, you know, I guess Ken and Kirk uh, got in a, uh, information from the attorney and so the matter is settled so i just am a little frustrated that we're even talking about this right now because um i think we need to focus uh on the crisis that we're in and i i'm unhappy about what happened i'm unhappy that anybody is traveling when we're all staying inside but i mean come on Barry. Um, I guess, you know, my opinion on that is this is, uh, we've got 50 people. We had up to 62 people uh, watching this meeting today. And many, many of them were here to see if we were going to sidestep this or if we were going to at least acknowledge and share with the public that we've done our homework. 
And uh, I don't think this has to go further than this, but I think the acknowledgement that we did our homework because of constituent uh, inquiries, I think it was very important to have it on the meeting today. And now we can put it to bed. Yeah, thanks. I, I agree with that totally. Anyone else? Garner. Garner? Thank you. Yep, sorry, I had to take the volume off. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, side with uh, Holly on this one. Um, you know, given what we've got going on in our city right now with the high water issue and with the businesses, um, that certainly is more important. I, I certainly am disappointed in one of our appointed individuals, uh, perhaps not exercising the best of discretion or judgment, but that individual has a right to their First Amendment rights. And, uh, you know, I certainly appreciate and support that. Um, I would ask us to, you know, in the future, look, look at um, when individuals are coming up, their terms are expiring and just keep this in consideration for the future. That's it. All right. Um, next item is the uh, agenda for Monday. Kirk? Well, for Monday, um, right now we don't have any action items except for the approval of accounts payable. Uh, we will have the discussion regarding the Edgewater report. So if the council members can come to the table with some ideas that they have or some suggestions of how they want to proceed, council can um, look at those and give the staff some direction, like I mentioned before, that we can move forward. That's perfect timing for a late agenda. I'm to <laughs> Any other items for discussion? Nope. Okay. Uh, we'll take public comment on, on any issue, any items. Again, uh, please um, uh, uh, keep the, um, uh, any uh, references to individuals off the table. Uh, and this is not a time for debates. Um, if you wish to make a comment, uh, please uh, raise your hand or do star nine and uh, we'll go from there. Keep the comments at three minutes. Anybody? Oh. Burke, are you getting any feedback? Um, yep, I have um, um, Vicki Cobb. Miss, Miss Cobb has um, raised her hand. Okay, Vicki, go ahead. Wow, I haven't been called Miss Cobb for a long time. <laughs> 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 um, just a couple of comments, I guess. Um, with respect to um, Dan Fox's um, activities, um, I think it was a I think it was a very bad judgment on Dan's part, um, and I'm going to leave it at that because I also agree with everything else that has been that has been said that there are so many more important um, discussion items that our city council needs to be taking right now, um, and. You know, I, I think I think one of them is related to uh, what are we going to do to try to get through this very trying time in terms of the impact that COVID nineteen is going to have on our community. So, um, I'd like to see our city council really dig into helping us as a community figure out what can be done. We talked a little bit today about what can't be done, and I, I think that's relevant and important, but I also would like to ask a different question. What can we do as a city council, as elected officials, as a city of Saugatuck to help our community get through this? Um, and, and I think there are things that can be done. Who's that? So, Cobb, I don't understand. <laughs> Hi there, we can all hear you. <laughs> um, so that's all I wanted to say is, is to just rephrase the question maybe away from what can't we do to what can we do. Thank you, that's all. Thank you. Uh, I have, it says here two residents or two participants raise their hand, but I don't know which ones. Kirk, you? Yes, um, Mr. Klungel has his hand raised. Uh, okay, Mark. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, I just want to, uh, yeah, Mark, say thank you for the effort put in by the Edgewater people. Uh, it was a little complicated and too many 
kind of options, but they're, everything is covered. And I, I think with some effort, we can move forward. I want to thank you for that effort. And <clears throat> just let you know that the uh, street is f totally flooded again today. So, uh, and I'm still on the east side of the road, not the water side. And I'm still being flooded, you know, by high water, but it comes up the storm sewer in the front yard and kind of pollutes our own property. So I'm yep. looking forward that we do something. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I drive around there every day to see what the status is, and it's been it's been not good for you guys. I recognize that. So I hope you can come to the meeting Monday night, um, and and join us in our discussion there. I plan on it. Thanks. Good. Okay. Uh, I don't see another raised hand. Uh, Kirk, you, um, Mr. Mr. Wa uh, Mr. Uh, Waskins would like to uh, be acknowledged. Okay, Richard, go ahead. Hey, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Good. Okay. Sorry about that first uh, uh, non-starter. Um, I'm going to agree with what Vicki said, and um, actually glad I didn't spout off at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I think this whole the whole situation we're in with the uh, coronavirus has got everybody pretty much on edge. We're all trying to do our best. Everybody's trying to adhere as best they can to the, the governor's uh, executive orders and trying to abide by them. And I guess with this one situation with Dan really set people off because everybody else is trying so hard and it appeared he was just saying, well, screw that. Um, I realize you guys have more important things to do than worry about what you're gonna do about Dan. It wouldn't hurt to seek what the um, Fire Chief might want to say how that may have affected uh, how the community is feeling about these efforts because the city has been very good about encouraging people to abide by the executive orders and that's you know what we all are trying to do to flatten the curve and trying to fix this problem that, that we have going on and it just would we want to send the right message we want to send the message to everybody to continue uh, their efforts continue abiding by these rules and working together and not, not working against them. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Do we have any other uh, commentors? Yes. Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Um, it's just a statistic. Um, as far as Allegan County goes, uh, on the as of the 23rd, there's been close to 570 tests done for COVID-19. We basically have almost a 10% positive testing rate for Allegan County. We've had none that have approached Sagatech, no cases here, but you know, this is one thing that scares the daylights out of me and it's coming. I do believe that it's gonna inch here. It hasn't come here. Um, but I just want everybody to be aware of that 10% is a pretty high number in Allegan. So that's all I have to say. And thank you for the long meeting today. Anybody else? Okay, then let's uh, move on to council comment. Um, Holly, we want to start out. I'm just going by the way the pictures are on my screen here. <laughs> Um, I, I would just sort of echo uh, what, what Keith said, uh, what Dick said. Um, these are tough times. I think we all need to be uh, mindful of um, the ramifications of what we're dealing with and we're all doing our best and um, we're all in this together and I hope we can all row together. Um, and that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Uh, Barry? Uh, yes. Um, you know, whether it was on the agenda tonight, I knew that uh, the gentleman that went to Lansing would be a topic during public comments. So I'm glad we addressed it. In my experience, uh, we've had this happen four times in my time in the council. And uh, we cross the same bridge every time. Uh, we had, you know, it was uh, our turn again. And uh, this is pretty much how we knitted out three of the four times. Uh, one time there was a different result, but we did not fire anybody. So that's all I got. Darn it. Yes, yes, hi, thank you so much. Um, I really want to thank 
uh, Elizabeth Estes and the Sagatuck Douglas Together uh, Initiative Group, um, the discussion and dialogue, the surveys, the results uh, within a really short period of time have just been phenomenal. Um, it is, the message is very, very clear that our businesses are looking to us for support and help, um, especially this year. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I take that very seriously. I think that that is my reason for being elected is to do what we can to help our businesses uh, thrive and succeed. So uh, I really appreciate all those efforts that have gone forward. I appreciate everyone on this council who has participated and um, dialed in on those meetings so that you're aware of what's going on. Um, that means a great deal, uh, certainly not just to me, but um, our business owners and our constituents. That matters, it says a lot. And, uh, you know, so I, I thank you so much, all of you for taking the time um, you know, we had 101 people, I think, today on the survey results. Um, the resident, the constituent uh, participation was 308 plus. Uh, so people are very um, tuned into this right now. And for us to be participating in that and hearing what they have to say really matters. So thank you. Mark? Yeah, uh, again, with the... Uh, light agenda. Uh, Kirk is looking for some ideas. Uh, following up on the economic relief review, uh, not saying I'm a proponent, but uh, one thing we can do is look at taxes. And I think we should have a discussion about that. That might be a good uh, an opportunity to do so. Uh, personally, if we're going to zero on a tax, I would zero in on the voted road millage and put a pause in our road, our, our, our road millage. Uh, but, you know, we started looking at Oval Beach, because we can't use a road millage for Oval Beach. I mean, that's a dedicated road millage of and by itself. I don't know in the ins and outs, but that's what we pay Kirk and uh, Peter for. But I'd like to have that discussion uh, Monday also. Can we do that, Kirk? You're muted. Kirk? Yes, we can right. surely do that. I'm happy to. Okay. Jane? Um, well, in answer to Garnett, I've been watching the um, what's going on with that group. And um, Greg and I volunteered to help out with possibly bringing some of the restaurants and some of the shops out onto the streets more. Um, in a 10-minute conversation with Greg, I came. we came up with all kinds of ideas. This is going to take a great deal of thinking outside of the box. Jen Davenport has contacted me and she would like to be on the committee as well. But I think we need to really use every outdoor space we have in Saugatuck and Douglas to open up the community. This is going to take a little work. It's going to take a little money. But um, I think that's the only way we're going to be even have a chance is to get people outside. I don't think people want to go to a bar and rub elbows. So um, we're going to work on that for the next few weeks and see what we can come up with. That's great. Thanks. Good ideas. Chris? Oop, unmute yourself. Boy, Ernie wishes he had one of those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just echo what everybody else says. I was so, I'm so impressed with the work that's already been done, the structures that have been put in place, the enthusiasm that people have. And again, it's what we can do. I, I echo that comment too. We've got a really, um, we've got a big hurdle ahead of us and it's gonna happen in a very short time and things can go bad in a very short time. So I think positive meetings, positive discussion, positive ways of looking at things is just so beneficial. I'm just proud of everybody that's involved in it. I couldn't agree more. My sentiments, uh, exactly. Um, we need a motion and a second to adjourn. Is there? I move we adjourn. Second. Uh, they move we adjourn. I assume Barry is seconding by raising your hand. Second. Second. Peterson. Uh, okay, first second of it. Uh, that's a roll call vote. Thank you all. Yes. 
Where's Monica? Oops, I can't sorry. hear you, Monica. Can you hear me? Yep. For Plank? Yes. Peterson? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Leo? Leo? Uh oh. Uh, you gotta unmute yourself, Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Johnson? Uh, yes. Johnson? Beckin? Yes. Trester? Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you all. It was a long meeting, but a good one. Good one.